Educators of Virginia, welcome to today's episode with Eric Francis, where we will ask better questions to promote cognitive rigor and question the depth of knowledge wheel. Eric is the founder of Maverick Education, an ASCD and Solution Tree author of Now That's a Good Question and Deconstructing Depth of Knowledge, and a professional development and coaching specialist. I'm thrilled to be able to sit down with Eric today. We are all in for a treat. Eric, welcome. How are you? Great, Chris. How are you doing? Thanks for having me today. I appreciate being on here on the show. I'm well. It's about 90 degrees here in Virginia right now, and uh, I've I've yet to convert over to running the AC. So so I'm a little bit on fire, even wearing this uh, suit coat, which is probably not a, a smart thing for me to do. Um, but um, I, I am showing up well, and our uh, our listeners have come accustomed to me. Um, making sure that that our guests have the opportunity to really tell us how they're feeling. So when I ask how you are, I mean it. And I want to know when you when you think about all that's going on, um, how how are you? How are you showing up in this space in this moment? Right now, I'm kind of tired. I'll admit that um, it's uh, it's been interesting, you know, for the last uh, couple of years, you know, just kind of, you know, emotions have really, really been riding a wave. Um, just, uh, really trying to think about what the world is still going to look like and what is it becoming, uh, especially in the world of education. Um, you know, it, it's, it's been, it's been, uh, you know, be honest with you. I'm glad, you know, you kind of opened that up there. It hasn't been that fun, you know, being a professional development provider, um, uh, being an author because a lot of things right now, um, I mean, there's timeless work, there's timeless, you know, skills, there's timeless strategies, but this is really also a time where I think education really needs to make a shift. And what I've really been doing to even, you know, bounce out my social emotional feelings about what's been happening with the pandemic, because I got torpedoed during the pandemic, I'll admit mm. that, um, you know, no one wanted, uh, no one wanted rigorous professional development, and I totally get it. You know, everyone wanted PD on, um, you know, how do I turn on a computer? And what's this thing called the internet? <laughs> and, and and really trying to figure out how to maneuver through this online world. Um, even this year, I mean, you know, if you think about all the narratives at the beginning of the year, build back better, come back stronger. And there's been such a need to address uh, the social emotional needs, not only of our students, but also our teachers. Um, and, and really, you know, trying to maneuver through that, it's caused me to be really reflective about how I'm doing things, how I'm approaching things. Um, has it been stressful? Yeah. Has it been tiring? Yeah. But has it been on a positive of it? And I try to look at the bright side, try to look at, you know, glass half full. I can thank my mom for that being the, uh, uh, you know, it's funny, my dad used to say she's a Pollyanna, but really, she like really teaches you about, taught me about how to look at the bright side, how to look at other people's perspective that's helped me as a professional development provider you know think about what are they coming into the room with before they get into the training um you know really looking at how education has the possibility to shift and you know we've been talking about shifting gosh since the 1990s but really have we been shifting or have we been scrambling have we been always searching well maybe now this is the great time so Again, I'm tired, I'm exhausted from it, but at the same time, I'm energized for it because I really have a lot of hope for education in the future. And, and I think we really need to change a lot of our, not only our um, uh, our causes, but also how we communicate things. Like, you know, if we say, you know, well, the kids can't handle that. Or even I've heard, you know, hey, the teachers really can't handle the rigor of what you're teaching them. You know, putting that out there, I mean, it just puts an obstacle right in the first place. and. Mm -hmm. We can't, we got to stop that. I mean, kids can do anything. People can do anything if we encourage them, if we guide and support them. And I think if we go through education like that, you know, <laughs> I bet you didn't think about having this conversation when you said, how you really feeling, Eric? But that's really how I'm feeling right now. I'm really, I'm really trying to look for uh, more of a hopeful thought about what we could do to make education better and stronger, you know, moving forward and stop being so siloed about everything too. Mm -hmm. Let's, Let's start, you know, we talk about an ASCD, the whole child, then let's address the whole, not a whole child, but also the whole educator, the whole individual. So, yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And and I love just 
you know, your, your authentic honesty about how you really are showing up and, and, and what this period of time um, has done for you, has done to you, um, but at, coming out, not on the other side of it, because, you know, we're, we're not completely out of the woods yet, but we're really beginning to make that shift and, and think about what's possible. And I just love that, that eternal optimist spirit uh, that you come into it with. And, and what we're here to talk about today is extremely relevant um, for our schools, for our teachers, and for our school leaders, as we are all engaged in accounting for unfinished learning, or as some, some folks like to call it, learning loss. Um, the pandemic, along with all the challenges we faced in the last two years, and they have piled up. Uh, it's created an overwhelming need and sense of urgency to better meet the needs of our students. So questioning and deeper learning, two of the things that we're really here to talk about are two important pathways for us to respond. And we're going to start really with your most recent book, um, um, Deconstructing Depth of Knowledge. But let's start with depth of knowledge. What is important for us to know? What's really important to know is that, unfortunately, for the last 10 years, everything we've been taught and told about depth of knowledge has been completely inaccurate or inconsistent with what its original intent and purpose is. And that might sound a little shocking, but that's the unfortunate truth. Um, depth of knowledge has been a concept that's been around actually since the late 1990s. It came out of the standards-based reform movement of the 90s when we all shifted to creating a system of standards that must, students must achieve and that we assessed. Depth of knowledge originally started as a criterion for alignment studies. So what you would do is you would take your standards and you would categorize them as one of four levels. And then you would take your assessment items and categorize them as one of four levels and compare them. Florida was one of the first states that did that instead of Bloom's taxonomy with standards. But somebody, created this DOK wheel that we were all given that we all see on the internet and uploaded it to the internet and basically said, this is our visual for depth of knowledge. The problem with the DOK wheel is that it's full of verbs and depth of knowledge is not about the type or level of thinking students must demonstrate. That's cognitive complexity. That's what Bloom's addresses, the behaviors. Uh, that students must demonstrate as part of their learning. When we talk about the thinking, the verbs, depth of knowledge looks about looks at what comes after the verbs. So the questions I need to ask when I look at the learning intentions, objectives, or targets of my standards, of my curricular activities, my assessment items, is what exactly are students thinking about or learning? That's identified by the noun or noun phrase that names the subject or the skill. How deeply must students understand and use the learning? That's all the words and phrases that follow the verb of a standard. And also, how many objectives must they achieve and what's their DOK level? So it's a really, a, it's a different way of looking at academic standards, curricular activities, and test items. It's not a replacement for Blooms, and I wanna make that very clear. I just had a conversation with a school district. They were afraid I was coming in saying, so you're telling us not to use blooms anymore. No, it's not that clear cut. This is something that will basically supplement blooms, but also we might supplement as in strengthening it, as basically saying, this is that missing link. It's that we always talk about what it means to think deeply, but what exactly are the kids thinking about and how deeply do they have to understand and use that knowledge and thinking or learning? That's what depth of knowledge really comes in and talks about. So again, it, it's a complex concept, but what I try to do in my trainings is there's the research part you can present with it. And it's for those educators who really want the research, really want the technical talk. And there's more the common familiar where I make analogies, where I say there's four DOK levels and you can compare the demand of those DOK levels to the demand on television shows like a DOK one is like a game show like Jeopardy. Uh, a DOK two is where the student becomes a teacher and they're the star of the show, kind of like Bob Ross with the joy of painting. It's like their show. A DOK three is like a reality competition like Top Chef or um, Lego Masters where you give the kids a task or a goal or an expectation or you give them a topic 
and they have to think strategically and use complex reasoning with evidence to go through that activity or to engage in that discussion. And a DLK4 is like a business reality show, like uh, Kitchen Nightmares, which is a wicked problem. You can either use what you've learned to address, handle, or resolve the problem and walk away from it, or like Shark Tank, where you do something innovative with it. So that's the way I try to make DLK simple. And that's kind of how I kind of do my PD. I try to differentiate the professional development. Like I differentiate instruction as a teacher so teachers will understand it. So, so I, I think, um, so we need multiple, we need all four levels in, right. in, in our instruction and in, in what the standards are that we're, we're learning and even the demonstration of the, the students understanding. So as, as we are begin to come out of this pandemic and, and we've, we've been pouring a lot of resources into learning loss, a lot of resources into unfinished learning. Um, no matter where you are on that side of the coin, it means it means the same thing is, is we, we've we've got some recovery to do uh, because of what the pandemic has done to us. What is that? What does that look like in a classroom with relation to the four levels of depth of knowledge? How how can teachers leverage that? How can school leaders leverage the four levels to to address what we're all kind of chasing right now when it comes to academic rigor and, 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 and closing some gaps. You know, cause I'm really glad you asked that because that's something that's a message I'm getting out there about depth of knowledge. Um, I really look at it as the method of model of the future. One of the things the pandemic revealed is that even though we've been standards based since the 1990s, we still have been really teaching stuff. And when I see say stuff, that's how um, a Nation at Risk, the landmark report on, uh, from the 80s, what got us into standards-based learning, that's what, how they define curriculum, is that stuff is, it's the very stuff of, of uh, education, curriculum is, okay? What I mean by that is you go into a teacher's room and you say, so what are you teaching today? What are the kids learning today? And the kid, they, the teacher will most likely say, oh, I'm teaching how to add and subtract fractions or I'm teaching theme with uh, Charlie the Chocolate Factory. And then you ask, well, what's the standard? Or well, what's the learning target? Ah, uh, it's over there on the board. No, that has to be forefront. The standards are like a finished line in a race, okay? And if you either run a race or you've raced a car or you've raced a horse, uh, you know that the finish line defines the type of race you're running. When you tell me that I'm teaching adding and subtracting fractions, or I'm teaching um, Pythagorean theorem, or I'm teaching uh, Central Idea and Theme with Charlie's Talker Factory, or Romeo and Juliet, you're telling me that the kids, you're teaching the kids to run, but you're not telling me whether they're running a dash or a marathon. And that's the big thing. Everything centers around the standards. Whether you like them or not, everything centers around the standards. We need to use the standards as basically the starting point. So when I suck talk about teaching and testing, teaching and testing for depth of knowledge, it starts and stops with the standard. You show the kids, this is the standard. This is what you need to cross to finish the race, not win it, finish the race. Okay. It starts and stops there. Then what you need to do is you need to tier your instruction to the DLK level where the students are, and you're using then depth of knowledge as a strength finder. So what you're saying is, okay, here's the finish line. Here's the standard. Can you do this? No. Can you do this? No. Can you do this? Yes. Good. Let's start there. So in that way, now it's not a deficit model. Now it's a strengths model. We're starting with their strengths. So teaching and testing starts and stops with the standard. You tier it to where they are. You bring them to what I call the DLK bar. You tier it to where they are deeper reduced, deeper reduced. Teaching and learning begins at the DLK level where students are. So that's where you're, the student, how the students experience it. So we begin with the student's strengths and we build upon it so we can rise to reach and go beyond what I call that DLK bar. It's basically taking the best practices of RTI and the multi-tier systems of support, but we're doing it as a strengths finder. And the other thing people need to understand about the DOK levels is that it's not a taxonomy. You don't have to start at a one or two to get to a three or four. You could start at the three 
and then tier it to where the students are, where they need that support, and also where they are in their learning and build upon their strengths to get them to that level. But we also have to all believe that our students can reach and go beyond that level, that they can cross the finish line, kind of like a marathon. It's not what about you winning it, it's about crossing the finish line. So that's how I talk about with DOK, you know, how it's a method and model for the future. And I came up with this as a response to what we call, quote, learning loss or unfinished learning or however we want to describe it. Because when a teacher looks at the, what they have to teach, if they're saying, boy, I have a lot of stuff to teach, that's putting it on them. And if you look at your curriculum and you look how thick those textbooks are, yeah, you have a lot of stuff to teach. And there's a lot of activities and items and tasks in there. But if you look at the standard and you look at it and you deconstruct the standard, which is the next step in unwrapping, unpacking, you're not just circling verbs and underlining nouns. You're asking what exactly must students learn? How deeply must they understand and use their learning? How many objectives must they achieve? And what's their DOK level? And you create that pathway to proficiency, which guides your teaching and progression of learning, which basically directs the direction and pathway of their learning, which always goes deeper, never backwards. It shifts because now you're looking at it and saying, boy, there's a lot of stuff to learn. I need to know where the kids are on those pathways and excuse me, progressions so I can get there, get to that level, reach them at that level and help them rise to and go beyond that DOK level. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I want to, I kind of want to shift it to your, your first book around questioning, because some of what you're talking about can, you know, a teacher can understand where a kid is, is, is in relation to the standard uh, to be able to scaffold, to be able to support, or to be able to challenge appropriately by asking the right question. The right question can also um, elicit the thinking that allows the student to demonstrate their level of understanding either in relation to the standard or uh, deeper than, than the standard to that depth. So I, I wanna kind of shift to that um, and, and in that book, now that's a good question, uh, you identify eight types of good questions. What are they and where should teachers focus their energy? Well, what teachers need to focus their energy on is really take a look at how we view and use questions in the classroom. You know, questioning is human nature. And I mean, questioning is what we do as humans. And when we ask questions, we're not assessing, we're activating and advancing learning, be it our own or somebody else's. So in now that's a good question, I identified eight questions um, in what I call the Cognitive Rigor Questions Framework. And I wrote that at a time where Cognitive Rigor was really big. It was right at the height at the beginning of college and career readiness standards. I'm going to say college and career readiness standards because not everybody adopted the Common Core. I know Virginia didn't uh, adopt Common Core. So let's talk about college and career readiness standards and what cognitive rigor is. Cognitive rigor involves demonstrating different levels of thinking according to Bloom's taxonomy or is categorized in Bloom's taxonomy and understanding and using different levels of depth of knowledge as designated by the DOK levels. What I realized is you can't just demonstrate knowledge. You also have to communicate it. So that's why I made the shift to questioning. So the eight types of questions I say in the book, that first there are essential questions. And honestly, I wrote that book because I got tired of looking online and saying, okay, what's an essential question? And there's so many different definitions. And even, you know, you read, you know, Grant Wiggins and Jay McTighe were very known for essential questions. And they say it's one thing. And then you look, read Ted Sizer, who talks about how essential questions are, uh, McTighe and Wiggins talk about how uh, essential questions are the most important questions we can ask. Sizer talks about, and actually that was Grant Wiggins' mentor, Sizer talks about how it addresses the core ideas and enduring understandings of a subject area. And then you got John Larmer with project-based learning who says the driving question engages you in a project-based learning. So I said, okay, essential questions are good questions. They can be universal, which is what are the grand or broader ideas or themes? Like I can say, what is life? Okay. It can be overarching, which are addressing more the um, standards of practice or the essential standards of a core area. So I can say something, for example, um, how does science uh, explain natural events and phenomena such as life? Or how do centralized, how do texts, uh, uh, address centralized ideas and themes such as life. 
overarching, which is the essential top, sorry, top, excuse me, topical, which are the essential questions for a unit. That's the one question that sets the instructional focus and serves as the assessment and driving, which is more about talent development and also personalized learning. Then you get into your factuals, your who, what, where, and when, where you're talking about uh, activating, advancing foundational knowledge and vocabulary knowledge. Analytical, which you're asking about how and why. Um, reflective, where you're asking about what are the causes, connections, or consequences. Hypotheticals, which is about what if, what would happen, what could happen. Those are creative questions. Argumentative, not where you're debating, but you present it as a choice. So don't just say, should a death penalty be abolished? You just say, should a death penalty be abolished, permitted, or depends on the situation? Affective questions, which are more your social emotional questions. What do you think? How do you feel? What do you believe? And personal questions, which is, what is it you want to learn about the subject? Or what do you want to know and understand? That's your own question you have. So when I wrote the book for ASCD, they really liked that framework and they wanted me to frame the book around that. So, but in that time, what I've realized is one of the things that I've had to do as, you know, an author of a questioning book and also as a professional development provider is I really got to focus on how we view and use questioning. And what's interesting is when we go to school, questioning is how children and adults interact. It's one of the primary ways. But when we go to school, it changes because Children between the age of two and five, they're all asking questions. The most popular question they ask is why? And what happens is, is that when they go to school, now it's the adult who's asking the question. The adult's the teacher and the student has to answer it. And the question is not being asked to activate and advance learning. It's being asked to assess and affirm it like a check for understanding. And that makes questioning very off-putting. Like if I asked you a question you didn't know, you would basically get turned off by it or feel frustrated. And that's not why we ask good questions. So when I, when you, when people say to me, what is a good question? I said, it's not what is a good question. It's what a good question does. And when I say what a good question does is it stimulates different levels of thinking. Remembering and understanding are good levels. Okay. Cause you're still using the brain. It's not exactly that they're lower. They're just a different level of thinking. It deepens knowledge, understanding, awareness. It expands knowledge and extends thinking. It piques curiosity, interest, imagination, wonder. So if I ever said to you, how did Edgar Allan Poe create an entire genre of literary fiction? I don't expect you to know the answer unless you have some background knowledge on it, but I'm getting you interest in learning that, okay? And also it encourages students to express and share their learning in their own unique way. That's also how I look at rigor. Rigor is not about difficulty it's about the complexity of learning and one of the most complex things we can do as a learner is to communicate our learning to communicate it not only correctly but also comprehensively and clearly that's where the rigor is because here i'll, I'll do something with you right now chris let's go into a lesson what is two plus two you would tell me four and i'd say what do you mean <laughs> that's rigor Right. Okay, that's rigor. Okay, now to make it standards based, the standard says understand how addition can be uh, interpreted as taking apart, putting together. Okay, so I would change that to a question. I would say, how can un addition be understood as um, increasing, putting together, taking apart? And I'd give you the problem two plus two. You explain to me how you got four doing that. Or you would pick two numbers. Give me two numbers. Uh, six and eight. <laughs> okay, good. How can addition be used to find the sum of six and eight? That's the deeper learning we want the kids to do. You also can give the kids the answer and ask them why is this correct or incorrect? That's a DOK three. What I used to do is I taught all the subject areas. I used to teach out of my content area to give up my prep hour to make extra money. So what I used to do is I used to do when I taught math, I always told my kids, because this is the way I was in English language arts, answers come free. You just have to tell me whether they're correct or incorrect. So I used to put a bunch of thing, answers on worksheets and say, okay, why is that correct or incorrect? Now they have to think strategically to examine, explain with evidence. That's a DOK3. Or if I shift the conditions, if I say, okay, you have this problem, 
what if this happened? Now you're having them think strategically. So that's that's also good questioning. The other thing is this, is that we need to allow kids to have time to reflect before the response. That's not wait time. Wait time is about assessment. This time I call it is think time. So the student can reflect on it. So if I said to you something along the lines of, um, how, why did Teddy Roosevelt start the National Forestry Division when he was president? See, that's think time, okay? Yeah. I'm not waiting for your answer. Uh, this is think time. I want you to reflect on that, okay? Don't you find it odd that a, someone who was a big game hunter was also a nature conservationist? That's think time. See what I mean? So now you're reflecting on it. Yeah. What if I told you it's because he encountered a Sasquatch in the Pacific Northwest? And what he wanted to do was he wanted to make sure that animals were that were basically identified and ident unidentified were protected and preserved and not hunted into extinction. Now I got you, okay? Because now you're reflecting on it because you're going, is that true? Is that real? And then I would say, go look it up on the internet because this, our phones, our computers, they're tools for instruction, not weapons of mass distraction. <laughs> okay kids are going to use their phones in their room we might as well go and have them use it productively i've even been doing this thing lately with discipline where i say if you have a kid on the phone why don't you go like this go and say hey i'm gonna give you two choices number one you can put that phone away or number two you can go online and see whether i'm talking about is accurate or inaccurate go find me the credible source okay so you're still allowed them to use the phone but you're not using to do it productively when i've done that with my students what happens is they would go search for on the internet and they found out there was actually a story in uh, The Wilderness Hunter by Teddy Roosevelt, which was written in 1898, talks about this thing called the Bauman incident and how basically it was about a fur trader named Bauman who talked about how he encountered an ape-like creature in the Pacific Northwest and it wrecked his camp. This is 1898. My kids were so excited about that that they basically wanted to read the story and they found it. And we read that chapter, we read the story. Now, at the same time, did they realize that's the reason why? No, but it got them into it. It got them wanting to learn. That's what good questions do. They enhance and encourage learning. They enhance and encourage inquiry. They get the kids involved. We have enough tests out there. And let me tell you, tests don't ask questions. They say, do this, here's an item, you get it correct or incorrect, congratulations, you either met or you didn't meet the standard, okay? That's why I even say about tests. We need to stop saying test and we need to start saying assessment. Tests, you either get it or you don't, they both go in the same place, in the trash. But assessment gives me the information that tells me where I need to go next, okay? They're tested enough. What if we used questions to get the kids excited? What if we used questions to say, so how did all the symbols in the um, periodic table get their names? Why are they in that order? What if we had a meteorite crash on Earth and we checked out to see what all the elements in it and there was a 6% element that was unknown? How can we determine what that element is? What would you call it and where would you put it on the periodic table? That gets kids excited, okay? Not when you assess their knowledge, but when you activate and advance it. That's why you ask questions. And the simplest way to do it is this. I'll do another one for you. Chris, who's the first president of the United States? George Washington. What do you mean? <laughs> okay, I wanna know your knowledge. What's interesting is people then clarify it because that's what a good question does. Encourages you to express and share your learning. So then you might say he was the first elected president of the United States, then I would say to you, well, what if I told you that there were actually eight presidents appointed before him under the Articles of Confederation? Well, what's the Articles of Confederation, Mr. Francis? Well, that's what we're going to learn. Because at the end of this unit, you're going to be understand how the success and failures of the Articles of Confederation led to the writing of the United States Constitution. That's your standard. Here's your central question. How did the success and failures, the Articles Confederation lead to the writing of the United States Constitution. This is one thing. And basically, now I got you interested in learning that. That's what questioning does. Yeah. Well, and, and I love the way that that ties in too, to 
to the depth of knowledge and meeting the kids where they are. Because as, as the teacher, there's both the science side and the art side of, of which questions you ask to, to which students, because you probably wouldn't ask a question that would be either so far over their head or so below their understanding that either it's not going to trigger that curiosity, and maybe it will, um, or it, it won't trigger, trigger the interest of, of where that kid is. So I, I appreciate that. And just the simple follow-up of, well, what do you mean? I mean, that could be followed up of if any DOK1 type of, of, of question or, or, or any level that is, well, what does that mean? I mean, you did it to me uh, when you asked me two plus two in the first, the, the first president, both of those you, you asked, well, what does that mean? And it automatically triggered whether I wanted to engage in that conversation with you right now or not. It's still triggered. Well, what do you mean? Well, let me think about well, that's, what I'm That's the big part about questioning. And even though they're called levels, let's not judge the levels. Let's not critique. Let's categorize. Okay. Because a low level is not bad and a deep level is not good, not better. Okay. And really our job with questioning is to get kids engaged. So let me give you, I'll give you another example if we got time here. Um, I was observing a class and um, the teacher was up there. Good teacher, great teacher, sage on the stage, very, very captivating, really explains it. But the kids, unfortunately, this is a generation where they need stimulation. They're a multi-sensory generation. You, you need to kind of time it out and you need to make sure that you're not talking too much, that you're doing a balance of, I'm talking, now talk amongst yourselves. or I'm, and, and I call that the Linda Richmond after the Saturday Night Live skit where I'm feeling very verklempt, talk amongst yourselves, I'll give you a topic. You know, did Truman drop the bomb to, you know, punish the Japanese or scare the Russians, discuss. You know, that that's actually something from the show. So I'm in the class and I, I got a text from the principal, I'm observing her, and the teacher says to me, excuse me, we don't know, we don't use cell phones in here. If you use cell phones in here, you'll miss the magic. Okay, keep going. And, Sorry. And the teacher looked at me like, what do I do? I said, go with it, go with it. And she goes, if that's what you want to learn, we're going to learn that won't turn into a unit. See, that's the thing. When you get the kids and you get the kids engaged, as a teacher, really try to get it where you can get it back to the topic. Because the kids will throw you off. But if a child asks you a question or a child gets you into something, you don't know why they're asking that question, especially little kids, okay? Because you're in class, you're teaching about addition. Does anyone have any questions? And I'm sorry, if you say, does anyone have any questions? You basically have invited the time for show and tell. Because that's where I was when I was a kid. When my teacher says, does anyone have any questions? I was like, yeah, why do I get a chill down my back every time my buddy walks past me? Eric, we're learning about math right now. I know, but you said any question. That's my question in my mind, okay? Social emotional aspect. Steer it back. So let's say, for example, you're teaching math, you're teaching addition. Does anyone have any questions? Kid asks you and goes, do you think bubble's a good name for a hamster? Okay. That Take the opportunity. Tur use those cognitive questions. Watch. Factual. What's the definition of bubbles? Look it up in a dictionary. You get the, dic you get the definition. Analytical. Why name the hamster bubbles? Okay. Reflective. What does the name Bubbles infer or suggest? Hypothetical. What if the hamster's name was Suds or Froth? What does that infer and suggest? Going back to the reflective. Argumentative. Is Bubbles kind or insulting? I love doing this with my PDs because everyone goes, oh, oh, it's very kind. That's a kind term of endearment. And then I go, thank you, Bubbles. And it's usually someone who's a different gender and or, or a guy or they'll go hey wait a minute okay see that's what i mean by multiple meanings of words effective what do you think about the name hamster the name in the hamster bubbles personal what do you want to learn about bubbles hamsters or bubbles the hamster see i got it and i'm still teaching because we are all literary teachers and one of the things about teaching literacy is not just comprehension it's communication if you are basically asking questions and having the kids address and respond and explain their responses, that's literacy across the curriculum. Nice. Awesome. Awesome. So, so what is it about a good question that gets at deeper learning? 
I, I think you, you described a little bit of that, but I want to make sure we make the, the connection between a good question and, and deeper learning. Is it because it elicits curiosity? Is it because you can, I mean, what, what is it specifically that the, I guess the, the anatomy of a question so that no matter what question it is, or no matter what content or age group, I, as a teacher can formulate a good question that gets at deeper learning. It's about not so much the specific question. It's about the delivery of a question. Okay. It's like if two people told the same joke, one's going to get laughed at harder than the other person, not just because of the joke, but because of delivery. Okay. So it's how you deliver that question. Ask a question. They give you an answer. What do you mean? Okay. Ask a question. If they don't have an answer, give them that time to reflect. Ask a question. If the kids feel hesitant to answer, do a talk amongst yourselves to Linda Richmond. That's how you get it. So what you're doing is you're using questions, not only to assess you can use them to assess i mean they're great assessment questions but you're doing it to activate and advance the learning okay and it's really just all about your delivery you have to think about questioning like fly fishing if you've ever been fly fishing you throw it out there you let it get there you bring it back you throw it out there you get it back you throw it out there until you get a bite your job with questioning, your responsibility with questioning is to get your students thinking and talking, okay? And you have to use your tools, your trade. Look, we teachers are artists, okay? We're the creatives. In fact, Benjamin Bloom will tell you that teachers, the creativity of a teacher comes from their question. We use Bloom's taxonomy to create our questions. And what if I told you Benjamin Bloom said, don't do that? It's for educational objectives. The question comes from the teacher and the question comes from how that teacher uses a question to address that educational objective with the level of thinking. Don't hesitate to say, oh, the kids won't know this. A lot of the limitations, what I even talk about with questioning and depth of knowledge is that if kids don't get to that depth of knowledge or that level of questioning response, it's not because the kids can't. See, kid, I believe kids can do anything, okay? If they don't, it's because of a presumed idea or presumption that they don't or they're too young or they, they, this is too advanced for them. Try it. See what happens. OK, I, I, I just I hear that about everything and it really bothers me. And I hope that as we get that out of our out through this pandemic, we get more into this shift. And I know it sounds kind of Pollyanna ish, but more so like when did we decide that we can't? OK, when did we decide that they can't handle this? OK, anybody, the pandemic taught us that we can handle anything. My gosh, the resilience we learned from teachers shifting that in a weekend from a brick and mortar um, uh, classroom to an online platform in a weekend. That's resilience. The fact that a kindergartner teacher, kindergarten student had to know that they had to be online, they had to be focused, they couldn't just say, here's my cat, they had to be disciplined. That's resilience. The fact that high school kids knew, or middle school kids knew, or elementary kids knew, they had to turn it on at this time, be there, be present, and they did it. That's resilience, okay? We need to stop with saying they can't, or they're too young, or, even when I do PD, I've had people say, my teachers can't handle this. My teachers can't handle the level of rigor you're asking them to do. I sit there and go, wow, really? Give your teachers a chance. Give everybody a chance. Okay, here's the question to shift to. This is what I do. This helps me social emotionally. I call it shift to what if. When I start saying all the reasons why it won't work, I say, what if it does? If I know I have to go and work out and I'm on the couch and I'm watching TV and I'm feeling lousy, I had a horrible day, I'm feeling tired, I'm like, oh man, I really know I should go work out. Yeah, you know what? It's not gonna help. I mean, I'm feeling lousy. I just don't feel like it. Well, what if it did, okay? So I go and try it and guess what? If it didn't work, I validate my feelings. It didn't work, told you so, okay? <laughs> but what if it did? What if it did, you know? 
I mean, I love it when I can sh teach teachers a strategy and they tell me it didn't work. And I go, why? Because of this. And I say, okay, so what's a different approach we can take? I don't know. Well, let's solve that together. That's learning, you know? I mean, seriously. So here's the question. Shift to what if. We do this in education. This is a great plan. Why won't it work? Let's talk for the next 50 minutes of this staff meeting or this PLC meeting why it won't work. What if it did? Okay? Yeah. We know what will happen if it doesn't work. It won't work. But what if it does? Okay? We need to be risk takers again. We need to basically say that anybody can do anything. And as teachers, believe it, live it, and help the kids with it. You know, it, it, it's not you looking at saying that I have to do this for an IEP. I have to do this for a 504. I have to do an RTI. These kids are coming to me with so many gaps. Fine. Show them the standard. Here's the finish line. Where are you in that pathway to proficiency? Can I connect this to something you're interested in or previous knowledge? I do a thing. I did a thing in an alternative high school where the standard said, um, explain why two rational numbers add, add and multiply to rational. And a rational number and an irrational number added together is irrational. And a non-zero rational number multiplied by an irrational number is irrational. This is high school. They've been learning rational numbers since sixth grade. So I said, okay, guys, what's a rational number? Nothing. Okay. What's an irrational number? Nothing. Okay. Listen to me closely. What is an example of a non-zero rational number? Silence. Listen to me closely, guys. What is an example of a non-zero rational number? Is there a number that's not zero? Good. Let's start there. Give me a number that's not zero. Five. Good. Tell me about five, what we can do with it. We make a rule. They give me all these numbers. I said, okay, now what if I put negative in front of all those numbers? Does it meet the rule? Can you measure it? Yes. Can you do the properties of operations? Yes. Can you count it? And concretely, yes. Can it be found on a number line? Yes. Okay, good. So what do we know about negative numbers? They're rational. Good. So what does rational mean? It makes sense. What does irrational probably mean? Not make sense. Give me numbers that don't make sense. Get in my class went like this. Fractions. And I said, what do you mean fractions don't make sense? They don't make sense to me. That was a ninth grade class. I had to tear that down to third grade to help them really understand deeply what a fraction was, that a fraction is part of a whole. It's actually a division problem where you divide a denominator into a numerator. Oh, I can do the properties of operations and get a what? Decimal. Oh, so decimals are fractions. Therefore, they're both what? Rational. And if it's a repeating number, it's rational. If it's a terminal decimal where it ends, it's rational. It's those numbers that keep on going on and on and on. That's irrational, like pi. And if I move it over two places, the decimal, what do I make? A percent. So that must be what? Rational. And ratios are actually fractions. So therefore, they're also rational. One class, and I got all the problems correctly. This is an alternative high school. Remember, they didn't know anything until I asked those questions. And I got them where they were, tiered it to where they were, built upon their own confidence levels, and got them to succeed. That's what we need to have to do as teachers. That's the future of education after this pandemic. Yeah. Well, I think that's a really great place uh, for us to, to, to end. Number one, because of time, but number two, I just, you know, you, you're leaving us very inspired about what we can do and, and what that looks like and, and really the mindset and the disposition that come with it. Because you talked a lot about, let's forget about the, you know, the, the we can't and, and instead of say, what if? Uh, so I, I appreciate that, Eric. And on, on behalf of all of our educators tuning in, just thank you. Uh, and VASCD would like to give you an opportunity to share with the community how we can connect with you and become part of your learning network. Thanks. I appreciate that. So I do have a web page. It's for my company, Maverick Education. It's spelled M-A-V-E-R-I-K, no C in Maverick. It's named after my daughters, Madison, Avery, and me. And I'm also a child of the 80s, so you can probably guess what my favorite movie is, Top Gun. I am yeah. so excited for that sequel. I've been waiting... You know, 36 years for this sequel here, and that pandemic—that's what ticked me off about the pandemic. Canceled it. Okay? It was supposed. To, it was supposed to come out uh, in the summer, and then the pandemic hit, and it never came out. I remember. Right, right. I remember. So, but I know it's good 
Because you know what the movie industry is doing? If the movie's bad or they don't think their money, they're gonna make their money back, they're putting it on the streamer services. Yeah. That's how the movie industry changed from the pandemic is that they're cutting down the time from movie theaters to streamers or they're saying, we're gonna put it on on streaming, but we're also gonna put it in the theater for those people who wanna see it in the theater. Like the time at the time we're seeing this, I mean, the Batman is still in the theater. It's coming on HBO Max on Tuesday. It's like, wow, that's such a short time. Yeah. Because what they're doing is they're understanding that there's audiences out there who are still afraid to go to the theater and meeting them halfway and also saving money. But getting back to how you reach out to me. So Maverick Education, M-A-V-E-R-I-K Education. My website is www.maverick, M-A-V-E-R-I-K Education.com. Uh, you can catch up with me on Twitter. I'm at, at Maverick, M-A-V-E-R-I-K, E-D-U-1-2. And um, shoot me an email. My email is Eric, E-R-I-K, at Maverick, M-A-V-E-R-I-K. I think you guys get it now. Education.com. And uh, thanks for this opportunity. I mean, I've presented a few times in Virginia. I've actually presented a couple times in Virginia ASCD. You know, you guys have a great education system there. A lot of great teachers. I've enjoyed working with you guys at conferences. I've done some things in Fairfax County uh, with some teachers there. And I'm really glad I can share some ideas and, and, and some strategies. And also, hopefully, spread a message out there that will get you really pumped up and really encouraged about not what this education system is, but what it could be. And what it could be, it's going to start in a classroom. See, professional development and growth, we, we got to stop transplanting trees. You got to stop saying we have this gap. Boom, let's plant the tree to differentiate instruction. Well, that won't work after nine months. Let's plant another tree. Boom, literacy across the curriculum. Well, that's not working. Let's put in this tree. Boom, SEL. And that's not working. Let's No, it's got to start from the classroom. It's going to start with the teacher. It's going to grow like a seed. It's going to grow into a tree. And it's going to branch out. So get excited and be excited. You got to embrace the suck right now, but guess what? What if things could get better? Yeah, you got me excited. All right, Eric, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for spending time. And uh, thank you all for tuning in uh, to Deeper Insights today with Eric Francis.